I think we're in this place where we we need to have a correction. We need to have a pullback because it was getting slightly out of hand and being driven by such a concentrated number of stocks. But we also need to figure out what is the path forward. And I think there's been a lot of premature declaration of we did it. We solved the problem. We brought inflation down faster than we brought growth down. And mathematically, that's true. But as we know, it takes a while to find out how the story ends. And with the Fed just embarking on a cutting cycle next week, most likely, we don't know at all how this story ends yet. Welcome to the Monday version of the On The Tape podcast. I'm Guy Adami, joined today by Elizabeth Young Thomas of SoFi. I have not figured out a good rhyme yet, but here <laughs> she is. Hi, huh. EYT. Good morning. Good morning. Just the two of us today. Just the two of us. I believe Dan Nathan is en, en route to California, and I believe you are headed there as well later this week. I am. I am headed there tomorrow for some very important leadership stuff. I will be uh, with all the SoFi crew. Well, it's perfect then because we need your leadership today. By the way, you should check out the On the Tape podcast this Friday as well because Mike Wilson will be joining us. It's always great when Mike sits down with Danny Moses, Dan Nathan, and myself. So tune into your favorite podcast or whatever Dan says for that. Okay, let's get into it. Last week apparently was the worst week for stocks in terms of performance since March of 2023. That's going back a bit. And I didn't realize that because you know, if you looked at the week, it seemed, yeah, it was bad, but it, it didn't seem really all that catastrophic to me, but that just goes to show, I guess, how well the market's been doing for the last 15 or 16 months. Well, and as a refresher, what happened in March of 2023 was the regional bank crisis. So if we had the worst week since the regional bank crisis, that's saying something. Now, this can still be taken, I think, one of two ways. It can be a correction in a bull market, or it can be the beginning of something bigger. We're starting to hear a lot of chatter about this is a growth scare. People are starting to get worried about growth. I want to push back a little bit on that and just please, be really specific. Please. As somebody who follows all of the macro stuff so closely, there is really not a growth concern right now. The consumer has still been spending. GDP is still tracking strong. Retail sales that will feed through so far from July into third quarter GDP are promising. So I wouldn't call this necessarily a growth scare in the correction in stocks that's happening a growth scare. I would call this a labor scare. And I would call this a little bit of an AI letting steam out of the balloon. So there's not a, a GDP growth really big concern right now. But as we know, and I talk about this all the time, the sequence of events, first the market, then earnings, then the economy. So a growth scare can materialize when the consumer really pulls back, not just changes their tastes, but really pulls back. That feeds through into earnings, which then feeds through into consumer spending that goes into GDP. That sequence has not happened in its entirety yet. I agree with that. So since you pushed back, I will push back on your pushback. That's sort of the <laughs> Dr. Doolittle form of this. If you remember the push me, pull you. Now, we don't play the individual stock game with you. That's not fair. And that's not what you do. But what I will say, and you have an answer to this, though, there are a number of stocks in the consumer world that have crashed. And I sure. rarely use that word. But for example, name like five below, which was a $215 stock in December of last year, traded down to, I want to say, you know, $75 or so recently. It's bounced a little bit, but you get my drift. You can say the yep. same about Dollar Gen, Dollar Tree, um, companies sort of on that side of the spectrum. That suggests to me, and I mean, I mean listen, you know that I'm the half empty person always, but that suggests to me below the surface, things are going awry. I think your counter would be, you know what, maybe it's just those shops don't offer what the consumer wants anymore. Well, and that's why I, I want to make the distinction between, is it just a consumer changing their tastes or mm -hmm. actually stopping the spending? So what we're seeing so far is that people are still spending on services. They're still spending somewhere. So for, for each stock that has crashed, there's been one that's done pretty well, especially in the consumer space. I mean, we look at Walmart's results. We look at some of the other results from retailers. They've done better than expected volume-wise Perhaps there's been a change in the mix of stuff that they're selling and the inventory that they've been able to unload. 
But the fact is, it's still unloading. So the only reason I want to make this distinction is not because suddenly I've turned bullish and I've decided that there's a soft landing in our midst. I do not think that. Let me be very clear. However, I just get irritated when we use the words growth scare to paint with a broad brush anytime that the market has a hiccup and we just say, oh, it's a growth scare. But it's real. let's be specific. Right now, it's an AI issue where people have gotten so much enthusiasm built up. Some of the steam has come out. And it's this idea that we are so much more concerned with the labor market now. And some of those labor data points have cooled. It's a labor scare. And it's an AI letting out some of the steam. So I think we're in this place where we, we need to have a correction. We need to have a pullback because it was getting slightly out of hand and being driven by such a concentrated number of stocks. But we also need to figure out what is the path forward. And I think there's been a lot of premature declaration of, We did it. We solved the problem. We brought inflation down faster than we brought growth down. And mathematically, that's true. But as we know, it takes a while to find out how the story ends. And with the Fed just embarking on a cutting cycle next week, most likely, we don't know at all how this story ends yet. I think you mentioned uh, in our midst, that's uh, M-I-D-S-T. Of course, if you recall, Sigourney Weaver was in a movie called Gorilla's in the mist, without the D, but I digress a bit. <laughs> That's a different kind of mist. Yeah, it, it, it is. But since you brought it up, um, I, you know, I sort of agree with you on this one. In an environment where you know GDP continues to sort of hang in there, you know, it's really hard to make at this point a compelling case for this growth scare. On the flip side of that coin, though, we're definitely seeing it on the labor front. So my question to you is. I know it was it was widely expected that the unemployment rate would go from four three to four two, uh, for a myriad of different reasons. I don't think that suggests we're trending back down. But what did you make of that employment report on Friday? Because I think there was something for everybody. Yeah, well, so I read it as a weak report, and perhaps that's mm-hmm. some of my bias coming through. So here's here's what happened. We yes, we went from four point three down to four point two. Some of that being explained partially by the hurricane, hurricane barrel that hit that people said took it to four point three temporarily and artificially. So now it's back down to four point two unemployment rate. Okay, fine. If we look at the jobs added, that's where it starts to get more weak and murky. So jobs added came in below expectations. More importantly, the revisions to the last two months down by 86,000. So that means that the data that the market traded on for the previous two months, the jobs added data, was stronger than reality. That's mm-hmm. a big revision downward. So here, the, the tricky part about revisions is that when they come out, people see it, we talk about it, but the market doesn't necessarily react to the revision. I think it usually gets sort of overlooked. This is something, though, that if we look back, let's say this continues to happen for the next few months, if we look back, we'll point to it and say, that that was important. That was an important trend to pay attention to, and that was an important turning point in the trend that we thought was a strong labor market. So I thought Friday's report was weak, much weaker than the initial reaction. The interesting part to me, though, was that not only the market completely whiplashed on it. So at first it thought it was a good thing. Then we decided it was a bad thing and everything went to what what they call to hell in a handbasket. I don't Mm. know where that saying came from. That's That's got to be Shakespeare. I mean, if you don't know the answer, typically the right (laughs) thing to do is just say Shakespeare and look smart. (laughs) Yeah. Some some literary genius wrote that one. So not only was the market whipsawed, but the really interesting part was that if we remember back to the last jobs data, the thing we reacted to the most was the unemployment rate. This time, the thing we reacted to the most was the jobs added data. So the market is getting more concentrated on what it wants out of each report and by the end of the day we know what happened. S&P was down 1.7%. Obviously it interpreted it as negative news. Even more interesting, there's so many interesting things that happened on Friday, even more interesting, the likelihood of a 50 basis point cut went down on Friday. So now we're sitting here with only about a 25 to 30 percent chance of 50 basis points, more likely looking like a 25 basis points cut, at least 
at least expected by the market. So that one, I think I can explain. And I'm glad you okay. brought that up, the expectations of 50, because I think a 50 basis point cut, I should be clear, because I think at one point they got up to like 44%. Maybe I've missed it, but it was definitely 40% or, like or north, right? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe, you know, if that rate had come in, and I think it was squarely focused on the rate, I think another four, three would have kept it north of 40%. I just think that ticked down probably assuaged, good word, some of the concerns of the market. So we'll see. And I think sometimes maybe it's just as elementary as that. But since, again, we're going down this road and I'm trying to connect dots, all these things are backward looking clearly. And you know what else is backward looking? Things that you're looking at this week as well. Tomorrow, we have the NFIB Optimism Index. And on Friday the 13th, oddly enough, uh, we have, I think, a preliminary consumer sentiment comes out. I don't know how important that is. But obviously, both those things are some measure of optimism or lack thereof. And obviously, I think the labor market, in terms of the those numbers and how they're sort of calculated, I think the employment picture plays a big role. Thoughts on the importance of those two? Yeah, so CPI on Wednesday. Uh, I just read about this this morning. The implied market move on CPI for Wednesday is only about 0.8, 0.85%, which is not very big compared to how big we used to move on CPI days. Now jobs has taken over that front spot. And if you recall, I wrote a column a few weeks ago called Demoted. And what got demoted was the inflation data. And what, what got promoted was the jobs data. So the market is much more interested in the in the jobs data now than the CPI data. The only thing that could be different about that this week is that because last week's jobs data was so mixed, the market had trouble figuring out what to do with it and really even figuring out what the main takeaway was. It's possible that CPI then will be the linchpin that decides 25 or 50 basis points. So if this week's CPI report comes in cooler than expected, I think 50 gets priced in pretty quickly. I still think 50 is likely more than likely than the market thinks regardless of what the market has priced in. We had some comments by, I believe it was Waller last week, about him being comfortable starting bigger rather than starting smaller, So, and, and basically saying he would support a larger move at the initial rate cut meeting. So there, I think there's, there's speculation in the market that they'll only do 25, but I still think the likelihood is 50. Um, when you look at Friday's University of Michigan sentiment report, that's what we're going to get on Friday the 13th, also remember, the University of Michigan report is more skewed towards inflation. So this is a big inflation week. Last week was a big jobs week. We had jolts and we had obviously the NF, uh, NFP jobs added number. This week is a big inflation week. So we're going to get it all in this two week period and then wait and see what the Fed does with it next week. All fair. So you mentioned now the importance of CPI is taking somewhat of a backseat to that of labor. And it's probably correct. And by the way, because I do pay attention. It is the cheapest thing you can do. For quite some time now, you have said, you know, you're not nearly as concerned about, you know, the inflation backdrop for a number of different reasons as you were about the employment. And it's taken a while, but, you know, the market's coming to that conclusion as well. But with that said, I don't think you can underestimate the importance of some of these inflation numbers as well. So is there something that the market potentially could be missing or, is this going to be sort of benign and trending the, the the way that the Fed wants it to trend the way it has over the last, you know, seven or eight months or uh, six or seven months? Yeah. So I'm just I'm looking at the expectations. The expectations are for 2.5 percent year over year CPI. That's headline CPI. So all items and then core CPI expected to come in at 3.2 percent. That core number obviously being the more important one to the Fed. The headline number would be a pretty big tick down if it did come in at 2.5. Last month, it was 2.9. So 2.5 would be a big move down. I would say that's largely like, uh, likely to be due to energy prices having come down. Obviously, the core number uh, coming in a little bit higher in expectations, and that would be a steady move. So 3.2 to 3.2. So I do think it will still move in the Fed's preferred direction. The risks now... I think are more supply related than demand related. And that's why I stopped being quite as worried about CPI reheating, reigniting and becoming a bigger problem. Now, if they would have started cutting earlier, that worry maybe would have stuck around a little bit longer as it would have for the Fed as well. D worried about reheating everything and having a double dip that we had back in the 80s. So 
I'm less worried about the reheating now because I think it would have to be more of a supply constraint issue than it would be a demand issue. I don't think that rate cuts at this point, because people are more worried about other parts of the economy, I don't think that rate cuts would lead demand to a place that it overheats the economy enough to get CPI back up. The risk, and I think we've talked about this before, maybe another time when it was just you and I, the risk, though, is in the commodity complex. So if supply shocks happen in the commodity complex, anywhere in the commodity complex, and I'm going to put food into that bucket as well, if supply shocks happen for whatever reason, I think that's the bigger risk to inflation. Since um, we're going down interesting paths here, let's talk about the strength in historically very defensive areas of the market. And I'm looking at you utilities, because as we sit here, the XLU is within a whisper of its all-time high, which I think we made uh, late last week or so. It, you know, we're at levels that we last saw in the summer of 2022, but I think we're making all-time highs. Now, again, it makes sense on a myriad of different reasons. Rates going lower should be supportive of uh, utilities. I get it. But I think there's something else going on around un under the surface here. And you throw in some of these historically very defensive names like Coca-Cola and names like that have done extraordinarily well. And again, the question one asks themselves, you know, is this a defensive posturing because there's something happening that the market's not acknowledging? Or is this just sort of make sense on a fundamental reason? I know when those, those questions, a lot of times it's a combination of both, but it's not a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at year-to-date returns, utilities in the lead year-to-date up 23%, staples number two up 19%. That's a big deal, especially in a year where supposedly we're headed towards a soft landing. There's been all of this debate over are we mid-cycle, are we late cycle? If you've got utes and staples in the one and two spot, chances are we're not in, we're definitely not in early cycle and mid-cycle, probably more out of the question as well. At least that's what the market is telling us. I would also say that's what the macro data is telling us. So if you take that to a shorter period, if we want to see what the trends are recently, one month returns, we've got staples still in the number one spot, then financials and real estate. That tells me that these are rate moves. And utilities gets demoted down to the number five spot out of 11. So here's one thing that I think is going on in utilities and why it doesn't end up at the top in the one month period, because of some of that air that's come out of the AI balloon, we had some utility stocks that really benefited on the upside as AI, as the theme grew because of the power that would be needed to power that AI theme. So there is an element of that Utes trade that has been directly tied to AI. And then there's an element of the Utes trade that's tied to defensiveness, that's tied to dividend paying, uh, and that's tied to some other fundamental reasons. Not to mention just less expensive than things like tech, less expensive than consumer discretionary, and even less expensive than staples. Vistra Energy, if you want to sort of put it in the show notes, but if you're looking for a name that obviously was the benefactor of this whole AI thing, it comes in the form of that stock, which had done nothing for four years. And when I say nothing, nothing until you saw a huge rise to the upside and a subsequent pullback. Now, the keen-eared listener and folks that are familiar with me over the years will say he's going to do it because he can't help himself. So when you said it once, I was going to do it anyway. But when you said it for the second and the third time, there was what no I question say? I was going to go down this road. So are you familiar with the actor Fred Gwynn by no, any chance? Absolutely that not. You, you, actually, <laughs> you actually are. Fred <laughs> Gwynn, of course, played Herman Munster in The Munsters. Are you familiar with The Munsters? Oh, sure. Yes. He was also uh, in a movie, My Cousin Vinny, he played a judge, a justice, and uh, Joe Pesci kept saying the word youth, trying to say Ute. the word youth. And he said, oh. did you say youth? Great line from a great movie. I don't know if we could put that in the show notes, but again, people would not have respected me if I didn't bring it up. Let's please continue because that's what we do here. What do you make of, since you mentioned commodities, X energy, what do you make of commodities, all energy? Because obviously crude oil, despite the geopolitical stuff that's been going on, it appears as though the growth scares, I mm -hmm. guess, globally are weighing on this. And it's growth scares coming from a number of different countries, not just China. I mean, there are things happening in Germany, which last I looked, I think – 
is the fourth largest economy in the world. So thoughts on that? You know what's interesting about the energy thing is it's one of those spots in the market that if you're a bull, if you're somebody who's so convinced that this is a soft landing, it is not confirming your thesis. And to your point, it is global. This is a global thing. As the dollar is falling, which it has been doing, had a little resurgence recently, but as the dollar is falling, that should help oil. That should help energy prices. It hasn't. And global growth demand has not held everything up. We are now trading even lower than I think most people expected in oil. So if this was a cyclical rebound, if this was a cyclical growth period where things like industrials are leading and there's a ton of demand around the globe for energy because there's manufacturing activity going on and there's a lot of consumer activity going on and travel going on, then energy prices would be supported by that demand side of the equation. Now, there's been a lot of volatility in the supply side, a lot of announcements recently about constraining supply and then maybe not constraining supply. So it's a little confusing and back and forth. But if this was, in fact, a cyclical expansion, energy prices would be more supported than they are. I agree with that. And, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around this as well, because I, my, the question I ask myself is, now, if you back out the geopolitical uh, stuff that's clearly been going on for quite some time, where would crude be trading? You know, is there still some sort of, you know, Middle East premium and maybe Russia Ukraine p- premium embedded that if things were to sort of straighten themselves out, although there's no indication that's going to happen, you know, where would crude be? But for that, we'll see. But the flip side of the coin is, and I've said this for a while, I do think if we see a rotation, out of technology, and to a certain extent, we've seen it around the edges. I still think energy is a place where people are going to find a home, regardless of the weakness of the underlying commodity. So there's so many. And again, I'm curious as to your thoughts because I think in some ways you're probably aligned with me on that. But man, oh man, the cross currents in just this conversation specifically continue to be excessive. Well, so let me ask you this: Why do you think Please. people would find? Why do you think people would find a home? From technology into energy. No, I think that, I think that's fair. And what I've thought is, you know, if market if the dollars are going to move, I think they're going to move in an environment where people are looking for value. You know, if if there's a push out of technology, I think it's going to be concerns about valuations and all those things surrounding it. And those dollars will try to find a place where at least the market can theoretically hide and and wrap their head around and make a cogent argument for valuation regardless of you know the growth concerns that we talk about, because I think the growth concerns are what's holding the entire sector back, despite the fact that it, they've traded okay. So you know I do think that's where money's going to find itself, but it's been a tough slog um, for a while. And I keep coming back to people like Warren Buffett, who obviously continues to build this stake in Occidental Petroleum. And you know the naysayer will say, well, that's just an oxy-specific story. Maybe that's true. But you know, I think he's seeing value in the space as well. There's been m a in the space too. So there are myriad of reasons to be optimistic other than the fact that the stocks have really sort of flatlined and gone slightly lower. So that's sort of my thesis there. Yep. And I would agree with that. I think people are going to look for value. I think even if we make it more broad than that, if there is some money that comes out of tech and discretionary, just those adjacent stocks, I think at first it's going to be looking for a rotation trade. And that rotation trade is likely to be into things that are more attractively valued and maybe not so much into pure defensives because let's face it, consumer staples not really attractively valued right now. So if people are looking for a value play, that's that's the rotation away from high growth stocks. I think energy could be a beneficiary. One thing that I continue to talk about is dividends. If you look at just the energy sector of the S&P, it's got a trailing 12-month dividend yield of 3.46%. That's way higher than the index. So that's a pretty attractive dividend yield. If you think that you can get capital appreciation at a reasonable price plus an almost 3.5% dividend yield, I think the energy sector starts to look pretty attractive. Agreed. Uh, I'm going to shift gears here for a second, but this is all part of the same conversation. You know, and I think you would agree with this. The market, the valuations, all those things were in place for quite the long time. So the setup for a sell-off was in place as we entered the month of August. I think what triggered that, and I think you may, or I think you can agree with me, is that move we saw in Japan in terms of what the BOJ did, 
uh, late July, early August, and then the subsequent move in dollar yen, the strengthening of the yen from approximately 161 uh, in mid-ish July down to 143 and change on that August 5th. And a lot of people were talking about the unwind trade and the cascading effect that it had on risk assets. In the week or so that um, passed by, JP Morgan put out a note that said they thought 75% of the unwind trade was done. Fair enough. And dollar yen acted in kind. It went from, I think, 143 and change. I think it almost got back to 150, maybe just slightly lower, 149 and a half, let's say. Well, guess what? Last week, I think on Friday, at one point, we were below 142. So we actually breached the low that we saw on August 5th. And as we're sitting here today, you have dollar yen trading about 142 and three quarters. The importance of what's going on in Japan for our markets, or has that now been sort of discounted and pushed to the side? Well, I'm glad you asked. I tweeted about this. I'm in your head, Elizabeth. I tweeted about this just one hour ago. If you look at the positioning in yen, Japanese yen positioning has turned net long. Uh, it It was net short for a very long time, which was the issue there with the carry trade. But it unwound pretty quickly, or at least a big portion of it unwound, and it's turned net long. However, if you look at what's called the yield differential, that would suggest that the yen still has more room to strengthen. And back of the envelope math says something like down to 132, actually. So that would put more stress on. One of the things that I've been reading about is that people still engage in the carry trade. The carry trade doesn't have to be yen, except now we're just doing it with different stuff. So instead of it being yen dollar, now it's like yen emerging markets or something like that. So they're just moving around where that carry trade is taking place. Now, is it more risky to engage with emerging market currencies? Absolutely. So then we just increase the volatility possibility as that happens. But the carry trade is still there. I think traders are trying to find better ways to play it. It's just not quite as outsized as it was before between yen and dollar. Before we 5,000, um, Wall Street strategists have had to catch up to the rally, a headline that uh, Amanda Diaz caught. And so we'll talk about this quickly. I think there are probably 16 or so of these shops that give forecasts for the year. And you know, at the end of 2024, excuse me, at the end of 2023, a lot of these targets were significantly lower. The average, I think, probably S&P target was maybe 5,000 or slightly less. And since, I want to say, you know, June, July, August, they've all ratcheted them up. And I think the average price target now is probably, I don't know, 5450 or thereabouts. You see where we're trading now. Does that mean anything? That, will the fact that many of these strats are going to try to play catch up in the year end, Do you think that has any bearing whatsoever on the market, or is that just sort of something that we like to talk about because it's visually stimulating, meaning nothing whatsoever? Well, when the when the price targets have been surpassed by the market, they start to mean less. And then the reaction to that means less as well. Now, I've said this a million times before, but I'll say it again. I am lucky to not be forced to have a price target. I do not ever want to have a price target (laughs) because they're usually wrong. And I think that a decent amount of the strategists who do have price targets are are probably not wanting to have them either because it is so difficult at the end of one year to try to predict what's going to be the case 13 months from now. And that's why they move around throughout the year. Really what matters in a price target is the direction that that strategist thinks the market is going and the magnitude. It's not the number itself. It's what you can deduce from the target. That strategist is bullish because they think the market ends the year higher than it is right now, or that strategist thinks that the path there is really important. And you have to get really down into the weeds to figure that out. So there are some strategists, I'll use Brian Belsky as an example here. So Belsky has been leaning bullish for this whole year and usually has a price target, has had a price target. I think he was the highest for a while. I believe his current target is 5,600, but don't quote me on that. So slightly above where we are right now. But if you read his research, he'll tell you that the path to get there 
is not smooth and that he did expect and still does expect a 10 to 15 percent correction between now and the end of the year, starting probably with what has already transpired last week. So it's the path that matters. It's the direction that matters. But at a point in the year, like I started this conversation with, at a point in the year where many of those price targets have been already surpassed by the market, I think most participants stop looking. Lori Calvacina said similar a couple months ago, Lori of RBC Capital, even Tom Lee last week, I think, pointed out that he thought things would get rocky along the road of, you know, where he thinks the S&P is going to be a year or so from now. So your point about the path is correct in the words of, I think, the great Mark Twain, I came to a fork in the road and I took the one less traveled and it made all the difference. You also said how lucky you were not to have to be uh, one of these strategists that puts out uh, price targets. You know what? We're lucky that you're joined <laughs> by you. We are joined by you each and every Monday and Wednesdays. You're a vital member of this team, and I don't take it for granted, Elizabeth. So thank you. I appreciate that, and I appreciate being a part of this team, and I love being here with you guys. But unfortunately, I'm going to miss with this Wednesday. Yes, I, I was have just to do going without. to say, now, <laughs> Elizabeth will not be joining us Wednesday because you also will be going to California, as mentioned earlier. So safe travels. Thank and you. remember, Mike Wilson drops on Friday. He's with Danny Moses, Dan Nathan, and myself. Market call 1 o'clock each day, Tuesday through Thursday. And of course, Market Matrix, which is, I think, week 18 or 19. It goes by like, wow. Just the same way the giant season just went by like <laughs> yesterday. Thanks, everybody. Oh, man. 